Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist. Recently, there's been quite a bit of hype amongst certain commentators about a study out of Brazil purporting to show a huge benefit in taking ivermectin prophylactically for COVID. Interestingly, there is now a second study out of Brazil which shows that ivermectin had no benefit whatsoever when used for early treatment for COVID. Now, these studies are not necessarily inconsistent. It could be that ivermectin works as prophylaxis but doesn't work as a treatment. It could be that. Or it could be that only one of the trials out of Brazil is actually a properly designed trial with meaningful data. So which is it? Let's go back to the science and have a look. These are the two studies. The first study is published in a rather obscure publication called Curious. This is the study that purports to show that taking ivermectin as prophylaxis for COVID is beneficial. And as you can see from the title, it is not a randomised controlled trial. It is an observational study. What this means is there is no way of knowing if the people who got ivermectin had the same risk factors as the people who didn't receive it. So the results are pretty meaningless. The second study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and is a double-blind, randomised, placebo-controlled trial, which is the gold standard for clinical trials. And it is this trial which followed best practice that just happens to show there is no benefit for ivermectin. So that's the quick summary. Only one of the studies out of Brazil actually used a methodology that was designed to show whether ivermectin had an effect, and that study showed it had no effect. However, if you would like a bit more information, stick around and I'll go into a bit more detail. In this video, I'll cover the observational study, and then in part two, I'll go over the randomised controlled trial as well as address the inevitable and predictable criticisms which will have been made by then. This is a slightly larger screenshot of the observational study. As you can see, there has been a correction issued. What's that all about? Well, it turns out that five of the study's authors failed to disclose that they had a conflict of interest. So the journal had to issue the correction detailing their conflicts of interest. And if you want to know more about this, Professor Greg Tucker Kellogg has made a video about it. And I'll provide a link to his video in this video's description, as well as detailing the conflicts of interest of the authors, which Greg alerted the journal to. He also provides information on what is an extremely substandard peer review process at the journal. Now, just to be clear, there's nothing unusual about having a conflict of interest in research. The majority of clinical trials are funded by pharmaceutical companies who obviously have a conflict of interest, but they don't hide their conflict of interest. Now, back to the study, the title is Ivermectin Prophylaxis Used for COVID-19, a citywide prospective observational study of 223,128 subjects using propensity score matching. Believe it or not, the title contains three pieces of misinformation. It's not a prospective study. It doesn't have 223 1,128 subjects, and the propensity score matching is woefully inadequate. Let's look first at the prospective claim. A prospective study is a study where the outcome has not occurred when the study starts. In contrast, a retrospective study looks back at outcomes that have already occurred. So which one was this? This comes from the materials and methods part of the study, and I'll just read out part of the final paragraph. The present retrospective analysis of the prospectively collected data was approved by the National Research Ethics Council, CONEP, under the number blah, blah, blah. Although study design, RRB, IRB approval and data analysis occurred after completion of the voluntary prophylaxis program, all data were collected prospectively in real time with mandated reporting to the registry of all events as they occurred during the citywide governmental COVID-19 prevention with ivermectin program, blah, blah, blah. 
So what they are basically saying here is, this is a retrospective study, but because the data was collected prospectively in real time, we are going to pretend it is our prospective study because that sounds more impressive. Seriously, most medical data is actually collected prospectively in real time. If you visit a hospital or a doctor, they update your medical records either at the time or shortly after. If someone later uses that data as part of a study, it doesn't make it a prospective study. The next claim from the title is that it was a study of 223,128 subjects. It wasn't. 223,128 is the population of Itaja. And apologies if you're from Itaja and, and I pronounced the name of your city wrong. Anyway, Itaja is the city in Brazil where the study took place. But not everyone in the city was included in the study. People under 18 were excluded, as well as those who had previously had COVID, at least those they knew about. They didn't actually do serology testing, so they wouldn't really know who had previously been infected. This left them with 159,563 people, which would have been a more appropriate number to have been used in the title. Although even then, there was very little detail provided on these people in the manuscript. In fact, the only information provided is that they were over 18. Apparently, the city of Itaja has more information on the people, but none of this is shared in the manuscript and it isn't used in the analysis. So let's look at the analysis. The authors of the study classify 113,845 people as ivermectin users for their analysis. Now, most people would assume that means all these people took ivermectin, but it doesn't. It just means that at an initial medical appointment, they agreed to be part of the ivermectin program. And the ivermectin program was meant to involve participants taking 0.2 micrograms of ivermectin per kilogram of body weight for two days every two weeks for a period of about six months. But the authors of the study kept people in the ivermectin users group, even if they hadn't actually used ivermectin at all. Now, it's fairly normal for not everyone to comply with treatment in a study, but the authors of the study generally acknowledge this and do two different types of analysis. One is called an intention to treat analysis, where people who didn't take the medication are still included in the analysis. The other is called a per protocol analysis, where everyone who didn't take the medication or placebo as recommended is removed from the analysis. The authors of this study didn't do this, and they didn't even acknowledge that not everyone in the ivermectin group actually took ivermectin. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if we were talking about a small number of people, but it turns out we're not. This is a screenshot of an announcement about the Ivermectin Prophylaxis Program, which is available on the City of Itaja website, although I'm showing you the Google translated version of it because I don't speak Portuguese. And you can see this information was posted on the 21st of January, 2021. So it was publicly available nearly a year before the study manuscript was submitted for publication. This is a blow up of the section that is particularly relevant to the study. And I'll read it out to you. Just as an example, when the health department started distributing ivermectin, 138,216 residents took the first dose. 15 days later, that number dropped to 93,970 people who took the second and third doses. Subsequently, only 8,312 people withdrew the fourth and fifth doses. That is, there was no biweekly continuity of the use of ivermectin as recommended. So what this is saying is by two months into the six-month study, virtually no one was actually taking ivermectin. In other words, although the study authors claim to be comparing a group of ivermectin users with a group who didn't take ivermectin, they are really just comparing two groups who didn't take ivermectin. Now, I could probably just stop here. But believe it or not, there are more issues with the study. 
the number of people in the non-ivermectin group was determined by subtracting the number of people who enrolled in the ivermectin program from the total population of Itajar. But this assumes the population is static, which of course it isn't. People move in and out of cities all the time. So the people who lived in Itajar at the start of the study in July 2020 will not be the same as the people who lived in the city in December 2020. The authors of the study did not correct for this. This shows the first endpoint of the study. Amongst people who agreed to be part of the ivermectin program and continue to live in the city, there were 4,197 people who tested positive for COVID, which is 3.7% of the number of people originally enrolled in the program. Amongst people who didn't enrol in the program, there were 3,034 cases, which is 6.6% of the number of people the study authors say didn't enrol in the program. And according to the authors, this is a whopping 44% reduction in infection rate. Wow. Well, it would be wow if it was a randomised controlled trial because then we'd know that there were no other differences between the groups. But in this case, people self-selected to be in the ivermectin group. And typically, people who self-select to take a medication have different demographics and behaviours than those who don't. And that's almost definitely the case in this study because there's no other explanation for the differences given we know that virtually no one in the ivermectin group took it for more than two months of the six-month study. You'll also notice that they've added an additional 114 positive cases to the ivermectin users who were people who took ivermectin in other cities before coming to Itasha. But remarkably, there were no people from other cities who didn't take ivermectin who tested positive. If this was true, it would suggest that moving from another city to Itajar and not taking ivermectin provided 100% protection against COVID. Given this is highly unlikely, a more reasonable explanation is that the 3,034 cases attributed to non-ivermectin users from Itajar actually also includes people originally from other cities and is therefore artificially inflated. As I previously mentioned, no demographic or medical information is provided in the manuscript on people in the ivermectin or non-ivermectin groups, but there is some information provided on people who tested positive in each group. And the authors use this information to perform what is known as propensity score matching. In propensity score matching, researchers create an artificial control group by matching subjects in the treated group with other subjects who have the same characteristics. So the idea is that each group consists of people with the same characteristics. So you reduce a lot of the bias that occurs if an observational study. You can't remove all the bias, however, because it's impossible to account for all confounders. And according to the authors, when they do propensity score matching in this study, they see a 56% reduction in hospitalisation rate and a 68% reduction in mortality for those in the group they call ivermectin use. Double wow! As an aside, the 6.6% infection rate amongst those classified as non-ivermectin use has suddenly jumped to 8.2% in this figure. I'm assuming it's a typo because mathematically the number is 6.6%. Anyway, let's have a closer look at what the authors are claiming is propensity score matching. In this particular study, the confounders they accounted for were age intervals, sex, history of smoking, type 2 diabetes, asthma, COPD, cardiovascular diseases and other pulmonary diseases, hypertension, current cancer and history of stroke and or MI. Now, there is a glaring omission from this list, which is obesity. This is a known risk factor for serious outcomes from COVID, but it hasn't been included in the propensity score matching. Also, we know from the study's methodology that People who were taking warfarin were excluded from taking ivermectin, but were still included in the control arm. So the authors aren't accounting for all relevant confounders with their propensity score matching. But it doesn't stop there. 
Propensity score matching by age was based on three age intervals, less than 30 years old, 30 to 50 years old, and over 50 years old. Now, the first two groupings seem fair enough, but to say everyone over 50 has the same risk factors for serious COVID outcomes is ridiculous. Obviously, someone in their 50s has much lower risk than someone in their 70s, 80s or 90s. Another confounder that they matched for was smoking. But here the figures look a bit weird. Apparently, the incidence of smoking amongst those in the study was 1.5%. But if we look at the smoking incidence in Brazil, we see it is about 10.2%. So it appears that the study hasn't properly captured smoking incidence amongst participants. Okay, let's look at another confounder, type 2 diabetes. 2.9% of those in the study were recorded as having type 2 diabetes. However, if we look at other studies in Brazil, we see that the incidence is 6.3% to 13.5%, depending on the region and diagnostic criteria. Third time lucky, let's look at asthma. Among study participants, it's 0.3%, quite low. Amongst the overall adult population in Brazil, it's 4.1%. Bit of a difference. All these discrepancies suggest that the medical records collected for the people in the study are incomplete. And this means you can't really do propensity score matching because you can't correct for confounders if you don't have information on the confounders. And one more thing, the authors referenced this paper in their manuscript, which was actually retracted in September 2021, more than three months before they submitted their manuscript. So in summary, this is a study that tells us nothing about ivermectin. Most of the people who were purported to be taking ivermectin actually weren't for most of the study. We have no idea how many people enrolled in the study were still living in the city at the end of the study. And the study could not account for confounders with propensity score matching because key confounders were ignored and it appears that not all of the other confounders were correctly recorded. In part two of this video, I'll be looking in more detail at the other ivermectin trial out of Brazil, the TOGETHER trial, and in particular addressing some of the criticisms from the usual suspects. So please hit the subscribe button if you would like to see it. In the meantime, if you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it.